Welcome to UC San Diego and the Japan Zoominar at UCSD. It's February 23rd, in fact, uh, the Emperor's uh, birthday, uh, and that's a coincidence. Uh, I'm Ulrike Shade. I'm a professor of Japanese business at UC San Diego and the director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. Uh, GPS is a school is a school of global policy and uh, uh, we have in strategy we are an international relations and public policy school we have a degree with a focus on the Pacific Rim if you're interested in our offerings please go to gps.ucsd.edu and JFIT is our Japan Center and more information on JFIT is at jfit.ucsd.edu uh, you can uh, look up our activities at JFIT at that site. Uh, there is a news media tab where you can sign up to our newsflash, which is a bi-weekly uh, publication that uh, just uh, keeps you reminding of who we are and sends you some interesting notes on Japan and San Diego. And right next to that tab is the Japan Zoominar tab, where you can listen to past recorded meetings. They're all lined up there. This is a weekly event. And before we turn to our topic today, let me just uh, uh, point out to you that, that next week we'll talk about marketing, uh, followed by Japanese politics and public policy with Dick Samuels, followed by Japan's space policies with Sadia Pekkanen, and so forth and so on. It doesn't end. We'll hear, we're here every Tuesday at 4.30 PM for one hour. All right, so today I have Rick Dyke and Robbie Feldman, so uh, you know what they, uh, what, what the announcement looks like. So let me stop my share so that I can show the two gentlemen. Here you are. Hello, Rick and Robbie. So let me uh, first introduce you and then motivate the topic uh, briefly. So, um, and I hope I can do this without mangling all of your accomplishments. Uh, so Rick Dyke is um, originally from California and first went to California as a, I believe high school student, I think you may have this in common. Uh, he then was uh, enrolled in a PhD program at Harvard and may have been Ezra Vogel's first PhD student there. Uh, we'll, we'll hear more about that. His PhD thesis was on the Japanese semiconductor industry. And upon graduation, he spent four years with GE in Japan at a time when Jack Welch thought that Japan was one of the biggest places for GE to be successful in. In his typical modest ways, Rick refers to those four years as I needed to learn from Jack Welch. Uh, he then left GE and joined Teradyne, which was a startup company in Boston at the time, and helped grow Teradyne, uh, a, which was a, a semiconductor equipment testing. Uh, or semiconductor testing uh, company. He helped grow it uh, from a small little place to a billion dollar company. And, um, and then actually changed careers yet again and did a management buyout of said company, which whetted his appetite for uh, private equity. He then joined Japan Industrial Partners, which is one of Japan's largest domestic PE funds in Japan and has served as a director and investor with, uh, with the Japan Industrial Partners for the last uh, decade or so. And um, I'll, I'll stop there because you can take us into the present, Rick, if, there, if there's more uh, to be said about the, the presence. Um, and then uh, we have Robbie Feldman. And Robbie's been on the show before, but uh, let me just briefly remind you. He's a senior advisor at Morgan Stanley MUFJ Securities in Tokyo. He advises the research department there because he is, he is a never ending, he's a, he's a fountain of new ideas and new ways to look at things. He he's also a professor uh, at the Tokyo University of Science in the Management of Technology program, which I believe has an MIT connection. Uh, you can say more about that if that's, if that's uh, uh, appropriate here. Before joining Morgan Stanley, he worked for Selman Brothers and in those years uh, was, was uh, often ranked the best chief economist in Tokyo. He has, he has followed um, the bubble and the burst of the bubble and has analyzed um, uh, what is going on in Japan. Uh, ever since he has nine books uh, in, uh, on, under his 
uh, name, uh, two of which in English um, and four translations. And he first came to Japan as a high school student. Uh, he's also been a supporter of the Japan Zuminar uh, and, 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 and a regular here, uh, Robbie. And it's great that we have this opportunity to discuss Japan together. So thank you for everything you've done uh, for, you. the, for the Jay-Z. So with that, uh, thank you for joining us. I think the audience has now found their seats uh, in the Zoom setting and we can begin our discussion of Japan is number one and the late Ezra Vogel. And uh, let me, I, I'm not sure I need to position this. We've already have come, questions come in, but Ezra Vogel, for those of you who are young, Gur, um, was, was one of the leading Japan scholars beginning in the 1960s, let me say. And uh, as, a, as a professor at, at, at Harvard and a, um, the, the chair of the Japan US Center at Harvard, he was one of the leading and formative voices of our research on Japan. He passed away in December unexpectedly and left us with a lot of thinking and remembering and reminiscing. And, uh, and in fact, his colleagues at Harvard did a wonderful um, event for him uh, but, which is on v Vimeo. So if you Google Ezra Vogel, Harvard, Susan Farr, or Joe Nye, or, you know, it'll pop up. And they did a wonderful uh, event on celebrating himself as a person. Uh, he was a real match, a wonderful person. And, 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 uh, uh, and his curiosity and his generosity, just... Uh, just amazing. And he also had this thing where he would sit at the I house at the beginning on the bench and just see the I house was the international house in, in Japan where we would all stay. And he would just see who's coming in and then ask us, what are you working on? And that was one of his ways of, of data collection. So Ezra Vogel passed away, his book will be us forever. And what's interesting about this book is that it was actually much maligned people have said a lot of bad things about this book. And so I thought we would uh, revisit uh, how we would want to look at this and all of the things that, that Ezra has, has done in shaping our views of Japan. So Rick, why don't you start? You were first a student. You then became a friend, a co-author, a, co a colleague, a, a, a probably a tour guide and or a, a, no, a host in Japan whenever he showed up and then that was often. So, so share, share with us your view of how we want to look at Ezra's work and uh, how we want to um, assess it. Thanks, Ulrike. <laughs> I've, I've been through several memorial services now, including two marathon sessions from China, one in Beijing and one in Shanghai, both of which went from nine in the morning till six in the evening. Uh, it's amazing the outpouring of, of uh, feeling and so forth that have happened after Ezra's death. As, as you said, uh, I heard about his death the first thing in the morning, December 21st, just a few hours after he passed away. It was totally unexpected. I mean, we were in mid-conversation. We'd been emailing during the week about various things, and he still owes me some answers <laughs> that, uh, that I'd like to get at some point. For, for about 40 years, beginning in the 80s, we had an annual reunion in Tokyo of what we called Vogel acolytes. And we had a rule at the reunion that nobody could praise Ezra because you just spend the whole evening listening to praises of Ezra and it would be, it would be boring. We actually started fining people 10,000 yen if they even gave the, the slightest praise of Ezra which we used to buy wine. And, and then that caused another problem. <laughs> but, uh, so let me, I, I think you summarized it very well. Gener he was amazingly generous with his time. Uh, and that was from the beginning. Uh, and I started working with him in 1967 when he was first got tenure. He got his first desk in the East Asian Research Center 
when I went in to see him, he was still trying to figure out what to put in what drawers. It was, it was kind of at the very beginning. Uh, and he was also rare, you know, scholars have multiple things they have to do as, as of course you well know, but he, he did them all very well. He was a conscientious teacher. Uh, I have in my library 28 books that he, he wrote or edited. Uh, and he was an institution builder, not only the East Asian Research Center, which became the Fairbank Center, but the Reischauer Institutes, the Asia Center, uh, which he also opened up to scholars uh, from wherever they, they would come from, but certainly to all of New England. Uh, and so he created resources that, that really made the field much richer. I have some slides and uh, let's see, am I using this correctly? Can you see them? It's coming up. There Is you go. Up? If you can turn it on, you're good to go. Okay. What I'd like to do on, on December 22nd, just a couple of days after Ezra died, I went to the I house to have lunch with a friend. I went into the library and the librarians had already on a table near the door put a single copy of Japan as number one. No message, no, no label, but it was absolutely clear that uh, what they were doing. And it, it was so touching. The librarians knew my relationship with, with Ezra over the years, and they said they want to have a, a display of Ezra's books and could I help them because there might be some they don't have. And that's when I came up with my count is 28. Uh, so sometime in the next couple of weeks, there will be a display at the I House of his full work. This particular drawing here, I think we can owe this to Corky White. Uh, I think she's the one who had this prepared for Ezra's retirement, which was uh, May 6th in the year 2000. And I, I, I won't get there during my first spiel, but actually after Ezra retired in 2000, he went on to 20 years that, that may have been the most productive years of his life. Uh, that's when he did Deng Xiaoping, that's when he did Facing History, and that's when he did a lot of his institution building. So uh, let, let me try, let me try to give you some context of, of Ezra's scholarship and what led up to Japan as number one. Uh, Ezra graduated from Ohio Wesleyan University. He came from Delaware, Ohio, a small town in Ohio. He was, his family was probably the only Jewish family in the town. They ran a store called the People's Store. His parents were emigres from Eastern Europe. Uh, I, I think calling their store the People's Store said something about their, uh, their values and their ideology. Ezra went to the, the local university, Ohio Wesleyan University. And then he went and he studied sociology there. Then he went into the military and he was assigned to a military psychiatric hospital. Then he went to Harvard into the Department of Social Relations, which no longer exists. But at that time, the Department of Social Relations was a combination of sociology, social psychology, and social anthropology. And I think he was really headed to be a psychologist. He, he did his PhD thesis looking at families in the Boston area that had emotionally disturbed children and what that does to the family and to the relationships in the family. And his first book is the one that shows up here from 1960. It's, it's a textbook really uh, about family psychology, family sociology. Uh, this was his start. His advisor, uh, Florence, Fluck, uh, Florence Cluckholm, uh, told him that he was really too provincial and he should try to get some overseas experience. 
He studied under the great theorist, Talcott Parsons. He had uh, sort of Parsons' very abstract theory down cold, and she advised him to go overseas. He got a postdoc, he got a fellowship. He was already married to Susie Vogel. They already had one child, David Vogel. And he decided to go to Japan. And he spent a year in Japan learning the language in Tokyo. And then he and Susie and David embedded themselves in a community in Ichikawa, in Chibaken, Ichikawa, where they studied intensely six families. And he spread out from that, from the idea of doing families with emotionally disturbed children to a wider scope. And that became the book on the right, Japan's New Middle Class. Ezra, this was 1958, 1960. They left Japan on the day of the 1960 Ampo riots. They were trying to get out to Haneda Airport. From 1960 until 2019, which was his last trip to Japan, Ezra came to Japan at least once a year. And every time he came to Japan, he spent a day going out to Ichikawa to visit the six families. Over 50 years, of course, it now went through multiple generations, but he kept up the relationship with those six families that was the original source of Japan's new middle class. He went back to the United States, he published the book, he got a tenure track position in the psychology department at Yale University. He was on his way to being a psychologist. What changed is not exactly clear. He blames it on John Pelzell, who was an anthropologist at Harvard. I also had John Pelzell. He was a, he was a very charming man. I can now see how this happened. Ezra decided that rather than psychology, he wanted to go back and continue in East Asian studies. Pelzell told him that they might take him back at Harvard, but only if he would take on Chinese. He had to take Chinese. Pelzell arranged for him to have a postdoc. So here he's giving up a tenured track position at Yale in psychology, goes back to Harvard on a postdoc with a wife, and by this time, two children, to start all over again, learning Chinese. At the time in the social relations department at Harvard, they also had a close tie to uh, the Russian Research Center. And uh, Merle Fansad, whose book you see here in the middle, Smolik's Under Soviet Rule had just been produced. It was, it's a major study, it's still worthwhile reading, of how the Bolsheviks took over a large, but the Smolik's area is a province about 500 kilometers to the west of, of Moscow. Somehow Harvard got archives of primary material on how the Bolsheviks, Bolsheviks took over Smolik's, how they ran, how they governed Smolik's. What it, and then Fansod also integrate, interviewed emigres, many of them who were in the New England area, to try to figure out what it was for the individual people who were living in the area to be uh, governed by the Bolsheviks. It was a major study. Ezra decided that with his Chinese, he would try to do the same thing with China. And that became the book on the left, Canton Under Communism. This is my version, my copy of the book that you see here as I reread it after December 20th. I found out that it was disintegrating, but still amazing study. He couldn't go, he couldn't go to China. America, no American could go to China. He went to Hong Kong. He looked at archive materials, but mainly, but mainly it was what he usually did. He did interview after interview after interview with refugees who had come over the border. And this was really the first glimpse that Americans had of uh, of what was going on in the in this case the first twenty years of the communist rule in China. The book won the uh, the faculty prize that year for a book from Harvard University Press. On the basis of this, Ezra was able to get a tenured appointment in sociology in 1967. 
He took an associate directorship of the East Asian Research Center also in 1967 under John Fairbank. And then eventually in 1973, he took over as the head of the East Asian Research Center. So here's a man who's had, who's had two postdocs. He's given up a tenured position. He's, he's after he gets his PhD, he learns Japanese. He, he learns Chinese. He does a book on Japan. He does a book on China. And then he's taking over from the, uh, from the Dean of East Asian Research in the United States, John Fairbank, and he's the head of the East Asian Research Center. It's just, it's an, it's an amazing story. But after this, the, the concern in the United States was not China so much, although Nixon went to China. China was still at best something that was in the future for the United States. There, were, there was another series of concerns in the United States that, that also uh, Ezra got caught up in. The, the Watts riots in the United States were in 1965. Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. Robert Kennedy was assassinated in 1968. The riots at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago were in 1968. The bombing of Cambodia, uh, which was the continuation of, of, of of the Vietnam War becoming hotter was 1970. Watergate was 1971 to 1974. America had double digit unemployment, loss of competitiveness, and a lot of it was blamed on the trade imbalance with Japan. Ezra was one of several sociologists who began to try to think that was Japan doing something right that the Americans were doing wrong? Was there something that America could learn about Japan? And as you see here at the top, there's Robert Bellow's book, The Broken Covenant. He became one of the sociologists concerned about what was happening in the United States and did Japan have a better way of doing it? Ronald Dorr, British factory, Japanese factory. And then Ezra also did a book under funding from the SSRC on modern Japanese and uh, organization and decision-making. And you see down at the bottom, a group of uh, congressmen from the House of, House of Representatives taking their sledgehammers to a Toshiba uh, video, uh, to, to, Toshiba tape recording. And then you see at the right, a Harvard bomb blast happening at the Center for International Affairs. This was close to home for people in East Asian studies because the Center for International Affairs was at Fort Divinity Avenue the Enching Library was at Two Divinity Avenue. Ezra is the associate director at that time of the East Asian uh, Research Center, wrote a letter to Henry Kissinger who had been at the Center for International Affairs and then was the chairman of the National Research, Co National Research Council under the Nixon, under Nixon administration. He writes a letter that's still in the archives at, at the East Asian Research Council. I am writing to convey to you my urgent concern for the future of our nation. I have never witnessed such a serious crisis. I cannot tell you how close the current mood of students is of one of outright rebellion against the government in Washington. In short, this is 1976. This is the bicentennial. And to many people, the United States was falling apart. That is what led to uh, Japan as number one. Ezra got a sabbatical, had a sabbatical leave in 1974-75. He went to Japan to do some kind of a study on how uh, leaders in the business community work with leaders in the bureaucracy and, uh, and leaders in academia about issues in Japan. He did his usual just copious interviews uh, with a number of people. And, but rather than doing the book that he was planning, he got a passion that the world didn't need another academic book about Japan. The world needed a book for common educated Americans to read and to try to understand that there might be better ways to organize a society. 
that became Japan as number one. Many of us, of course, there wasn't email in those days and you couldn't send attachments. Many of us received manila envelopes of this draft from Ezra saying, please read this. You know, I feel strongly about this. And many of us opened it, read it and said, don't publish it, <laughs> Ezra. This is not worthy of, of, a, of a scholar of, of your stature. Ed Reischer, ha Ed Reischer had a slightly, slightly different opinion. He said, Ezra, if you publish it, make it mandatory reading in the United States, but make sure that it is banned in Japan. As we know, the rest is sort of all history. It was published by Harvard, Uni Harvard University Press. Uh, in the United States, it was a bestseller, especially for Harvard University Press, sold 50, 55,000 copies. In Japan, the Japanese translation published it on almost the same month as the English edition, sold 520,000 copies. I'd always thought that it sold 350,000, but I, I called a friend from uh, an old friend that Ezra worked with at TBS Britannica and said, was it 350,000? He says, no, it was 520,000. The price of the English edition was $12.50, so it grossed $687,500. The price of the Japanese edition was surprisingly high for a Japanese book. It was 1,300 yen. 760 million yen, it was about 200 yen to the dollar. It was that gross $3.4 million. I must say that there was a quirk in Ezra's contract with Harvard University Press. He actually got relatively few of the royalties from the Japanese edition. So this was a great contribution to uh, the Harvard University Press. But I gave this story on uh, the Shanghai Memorial Service. And I pointed out the dedication in the book. The dedication is to David, Stephen, and Eva, his, his three children. May they live in a better America. And I think that the Japanese is even more poignant. Kimi tachi ga yori subrashi America ni ikute iku megatte. That was the point of the book. It was written because he was concerned about the future of America. Let me just briefly point out, oops, can I change? Okay, that Ezra's book wasn't the only one. And there was, uh, there was a major study that was done at Brookings that also came, down, came out in 1976. I, I, I still keep this on my shelf. I actually find it much easier reading than then Japan is number one. But Hugh Patrick and Henry Rosofsky put together a major project where they intentionally got economists and social scientists who were the best in their field, but were not Japanese specialists to take chapter by chapter, the taxation system in Japan, the financial system in Japan. And, and look at the names that they got, Edward Dennison, Gardner Ackley, Henry Wallach, Mabel Wallach, Joseph Peckman, Richard, K Richard Caves, Phil Trisice, Nathan Glazer. An amazing book. They spent a year, they teamed up with Japanese colleagues. And you know, if you want to read a, a book about the way the United States was viewing Japan in those days, I think th this is the one that, that I would choose. This is my also well-worn copy. But here are some of the things that they, that uh, they, they ask at the end, I guess they had a session saying, what are the lessons that you people learn? And they had a hard time getting lessons out of, the, out of these amazing scholars, maybe because they didn't want to go out on a limb, but here's some of the things that they have on page 919, 923. What happened to Japan was not a miracle. Japan is not a nation of superhumans. We need not live in awe of Japan, but we can learn how a country does well with its limitations. Japan has learned to make the best of adversity. The absence of domestic sources of raw materials has spawned an infrastructure of bulk carriers and port facilities like liquid natural gas, which is a Japanese invention. 
Japan's lesson of making the most out of little and surviving in densely crowded conditions may over time be more relevant to other parts of Asia than the US model. Small farms and small time farmers are served by an industry which provides implements of appropriate cost and scale, which someday may serve farmers in other parts of Asia. Rapid economic growth also hides blemishes. Japanese companies are less cooperative among themselves than the Japanese incorporated myth would imply. The record of government's targeting industry is mixed. The social costs of pollution and urban congestion will need to be paid. This is 1976. I, I just like to go on for one more uh, Rick, thing. Rick, can we, uh, can we maybe uh, start the conversation at some point here before we move on to Asia? Okay, I, uh, just, just two sentences. Absolutely. Ezra went on in the 80s to continue basically looking at Japan, but looking at the impact that Japan had on the industri industrialization of the, of the other countries in Asia, namely Taiwan, Korea, and Singapore and Southeast Asia. And he, 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 he created a course called Industrializing East Asia. And that was what you see on the left, the four little dragons. At the time in China, the best that China could do, and this is in the, in the conclusion of his book, uh, Step Ahead in China, was by 1988, the Chinese had finally realized, they finally had dis disabused themselves of illusions and realized that they were serious, seriously behind not only Japan, but their other neighbors in Asia. Okay, let, let, let me stop there then. Yeah, can you uh, maybe stop the screen share so that oh. the audience can can see us? Yeah, uh, yes. And yes, there was actually an event to celebrate uh, this this book that I, I find you know. So this is a a, a, a different cover, same thing. I, I guess I bought the five hundred thousands version or, or something like that. So uh, before Robbie, before we turn to you, let me just uh, maybe say a few things about number one, and then I want to hear you sort of um uh offer the uh, sort of the, the the larger context of somebody who was a student at the time it came out um i think there are three things about this that japan is number one so first of all uh, the the reviews at the time were horrible um there, this was torn apart as you know with everything that's bad about our 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 field and how can you say these things there's um, I, I just had a, took this as an opportunity to reread it, and and in many places there's an, an insertion there like Japan on the average does this this and this, and it, uh, I, I noted it and I realized that maybe that was added later, or maybe perhaps on your good advice, like the, tone it down a little bit and, and don't don't make the Japanese sound so wonderful, but he wasn't really writing about Japan, right? He was writing about America, as you said, and he was saying, well, maybe we can learn from other places. And I think the, the three things that this book has done from my vantage point is first, it has drawn in US researchers from all kinds of disciplines, in particular, though, the business schools, to study Japanese management practices and whether there's something to be found in Japan that can help American companies organize their HR processes and their operations management better. So that's for me, uh, the first big impact that this book has said. The second is that it, it created for Japan an akogare, as the Japanese would say, an aspiration, a goal. And not only we want to be number one, but also the language around that, like Japan is a small island and you know we have to catch up and a framing and a sort of, you know, this is what we want to be. And to this day, a lot of people still in Japan talk about the need to be sort of ranked, which Germans, by the way, do not have. Uh, but but there's this, this need to be ranked, right? And, and, and then third, I would say he actually nailed it in the sense that, that this book covers it's a roadmap of research that has been done since, and it covers a lot of the important points. Now, whether you like the way it was represented or not, I don't know. But but so I would say this was a great book. It brought in you know it, it brought in a lot of new interest. It, it 
for the, the basis of study tours and and it it has it has really changed the way uh, Americans think about not not necessarily how to do research, but that we can actually learn from a different place, right? So, so with that, Robbie, let me um, uh, give you the microphone and alert the audience that if you want to join this conversation, please type it up in the Q and A, and I'll try to uh, to build you into the conversation. We have a very uh, a very heavy audience. Uh, the before mentioned Hugh Patrick is here with us and, and others. So um, hopefully they can join us. So Robbie, uh, let's turn to you. You have uh, you have uh, sort of some different views on this, I think. Hey, thanks very much. And thanks uh, Rick and uh, Ulrika for organizing this today. Um, I think it's extremely interesting that uh, Rick brought up uh, the Asia's New Giant book in the context of Japan as number one. Um, because as one reads through Japan as number one today, as you look at the reviews, uh, a lot of them are, uh, as Ulrika mentioned, very, very harsh. Uh, but as I read it today, I sort of think of the book uh, as I think about uh, a visit to New York City. It's easy to see the bad stuff. But if you're living in New York and you want to enjoy life, you say, OK, what are the good things? Where do you find beauty? OK. And there's a lot of beauty in this book. So for example, since I'm now teaching uh, at uh, Tokyo University of Science, I'm very interested in, in how technology and organizations interact with each other. Okay? And uh, Ezra has in this book uh, a number of observations about how uh, the Japanese system at that time as he perceived it dealt with the issues of technology. Um, one point he makes is about Horizon. And he asserts that the lifetime employment system encourages technology adoption because investing in workers pays off. If they learn new technology, you know, then that's good for the company. He talks about status, good sociologist there. And he says that status is separated from the task that you do. Okay. And therefore, he says, it's easier for people to learn new skills. External technology oversight is a number, uh, another point. It's the banks and the bureaucrats who go around and tell companies what's new and make sure they're trying to remain competitive. And there's a fourth element called a dynamic adjustment element in Ezra's model of technology, which is because technology changes so fast, lifetime employment actually helps people get the right skills at the right time. This is a model of how Japan incorporates technology. Now, there are a lot of ways you could rebuttal this uh, or rebuttal against it. Okay. What if firms want to keep their employees and don't want them to quit? Why send somebody off to you know, Harvard or Yale or, or Stanford to get educated if they just come back and start quitting? And that's exactly what happened in the 1980s. Uh, and firms shrunk down their foreign um, a study for their, for their employees. Um, one of the other extraordinarily good insights in this book uh, is that how Japanese companies uh, promote people on their basis on the basis of how well they get along with other people. From an American point of view, especially at that point, that sounds a little crazy. But today, it sounds really good. Uh, there's some new work by uh, scholar Alex Pentland at the MIT Media Lab, uh, who uh, has this model of how good teamwork evolves. And what he says is that talking well with other people is an absolutely essential point in getting information to move around. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think that what, uh, what Ezra pointed out in the book about how technology and organizations interact, you can either agree or disagree with it. There's a lot of debate to be made, but it sure makes you think about an issue that is extraordinarily important. And, and one that goes to the heart of what's happening in East Asia today. Is the Japanese system capable of incorporating new technology? Is the Chinese system, a very authoritarian approach, capable of doing that. Another MIT scholar right now, uh, Yasheng uh, Huang, is working on this from a broad sweep of Chinese history. And his point uh, is that when you have an authoritarian regime, it's a little hard for uh, people to be open about the technology they want to talk about because there's an ideology. That's also true to an extent within Japanese companies. So I think one thing that Ezra did in this book was open up this idea that we need a model of how technology and organizations interact. That's very true for the United States today with our failures in education policy, in R&D policy, um, and also recognizing uh, what 
Ezra called the communitarian vision. I don't like the word very much, uh, but recognizing the notion that what we do has impact on other people. So for example, wearing masks. Almost nobody in Japan objects to wearing masks because it helps protect other people. That's not the attitude in the US, okay? So I think uh, Ezra's vision there uh, uh, is that uh, technology is something uh, that affects other people as well. And we have to take that into account when we uh, set our policies, something I hope is beginning to happen uh, in, um, in Japan uh, or in the United States uh, today. So let me uh, end my remarks there, go back to Rick perhaps. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I, we actually have, I, I received a question from, from somebody in the audience uh, uh, even before the event. Uh, and, and I thought it was it was really worthwhile. So Hassan uh, was, was asking, what are some of the managed pra management practices that we have adopted in the United States that Ezra flagged? And, and, and Robbie, you took us there a little bit, right? So the, our attitudes towards technology, our, you know, the, the mechanisms that companies have to assure that technology bets would be taken with a long-term view and and some of the the practices around this um and, uh, rick do you do you want to add to that to that question i mean so what have we actually learned from from have if anything what have we learned well, well, since yeah since i was in the semiconductor industry at the time that this was happening uh Competition, first of all, competition with Japanese companies was very good for American companies. And, uh, and, and part of what Ezra did too, but other people, he, he went out and he spoke at, at uh, wherever he could get the podium, he would speak. But, but think of it, out of competition with Japan, we had things like the Baldridge Award, which perhaps is not so popular now, but was a big thing at the time on quality control. And in the Boston area, we formed, because uh, Teradyne, as I was waiting for, was a Boston company. Uh, around MIT, we brought over Japanese experts and made a center for quality management at MIT. And that a number of companies, analog devices, Teradyne, digital equipment, digital equipment failed for other reasons, <laughs> not, not, uh, and, and just decided, in the late 70s, early 80s, to do what the Japanese managers do, form quality circles. It, it, in the semiconductor industry, I think it was really very impactful because the key thought that Japanese brought to quality control was not to make a better product, but how not to make a bad product. <laughs> Which, which was sort of revolutionary for Intel, Texas Instruments, National Semiconductor. And step by step, they were able to get their yields up to what the Japanese were getting. Uh, so it, there, was, there, was a, there was a lot of impact. But I think when we talk about technology, we talk about two things, one, how to bring a new technology product to the market, and the other, how to use technology to be more productive in, in your own company. Uh, so one of the areas where uh, Japan's impact has been uh, really strong is this whole notion of how to manage corporate culture and how to manage people so that uh, they, they engage in work practice, as Robbie just said, that they engage in work practices that benefit the company in the long run that are, um, that are about uh, building quality. So Bob Cole has, uh, has this whole study about how the Toyota production system uh, really uh, is so much um, uh, better in so many ways than, than the Fordism and the Taylor approach to thinking of, of people as cogs in the large machine that need to be supervised and are otherwise stupid. I mean, you know, Toyota said, well, we don't have the luxury, we don't have enough workers to think of them as that. So we need to have them engaged and, and empowered and we train them and so that they can make sure that we 
build good stuff. And so, so culture and uh, corporate culture and, and HR practices is certainly one. Then we have a whole lot of literature on the supplier relations, and that goes back into the sociology of, of what a company is in society and how a company is organized and how a company relates to the community it's in and its suppliers. And, and um, and as uh, Robbie, I, I I really agree with you how how a lot of this is in in this book. A lot of this was also in Ronald Dorr's work, right? Taking Japan seriously was another one of those that really was a wake up call for the U.S. and that we need to start thinking about alternative ways of of, of doing things if we want to if we want to be re remain number one, right? So it made maybe the U.S. competitive as well. Robbie, if you I want may. to say something? Yeah, if I may, uh, you mentioned uh, Henry, uh, the Ford system. And I think we have to make a distinction between what Ford turned into and what Henry Ford himself was doing. Because in the early days, Ford had a terrible problem with turnover on the production line. It was boring, people weren't used to it. And what did he do? He raised wages immensely. And so his workers were paid, they said enough to buy one of his cars, but that wasn't the point. The point was he wanted to pay them enough so they would stick around and productivity just went through the roof because he paid his, way, his workers a reasonable wage. Everybody around him thought he was crazy, but he did it because he thought taking care of the workers would improve the productivity at his firm. That's something that somehow American uh, industry forgot for a while. Uh, maybe this uh, talk about the minimum wage where we won't um, uh, impact it. But I think we have to look uh, into Japan, not only uh, for new ideas, but also as a mirror of things that maybe some of we have done uh, by ourselves. If I can make a, a different point, uh, which is uh, the interaction, as Rick was saying, between Japanese and American uh, industry. Um, the MIT Media Lab today huge source of very, very interesting thought, was actually founded with Japanese money. And that happened uh, because Jerome Wiesner, who had just stepped down uh, from president of MIT, many years earlier had been President Kennedy's science advisor. President Kennedy told him, look, you know, we need help building new missile parts, building new electronics, go to Japan, figure out what they can do for us. Wiesner did that. He built up a huge set of uh, good ties with Japanese industry. And when it came time for Wiesner to step down as MIT president, he wanted to uh, uh, raise money for this new media lab. Um, and so he went to Japan and they gave him all the money he needed to get it, uh, get it going again. So what act I think happened in, in terms of what Rick was saying uh, is that uh, America industry sort of relearned not only uh, to do the right things, but do things right in the term, terminology of your book, uh, because American industry had forgot some of that and relearned it from Japan. So let me stop there. By the way, the, uh, the building of the Media Lab was designed by Maki Fumihiko, so it was even designed okay. by a Japanese. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, actually, Hiroki makes an interesting point. Let me, let me uh, point this out to you. Uh, she said that, um, it, was that criticism really fair of the book? Bef because before Vogel, the dominant method of explaining what Japan did were some cultural explanations. And of course, then went into this Nihonjin run and, and all of the, the sort of the weird things that, that uh, you know, kind of the cultural determinism and the Japanese are doing this because they're Japanese. And, and what Hiroki points out is that, that actually this book you know, even as uh, you know, kind of chastised as it was at the time, brought in the sociology and then and methods of sociological research into area studies in a way that hadn't really been done before. What do you think about that? I I, I think it's true, but I think it's not only Ezra. I think it's also Ronald Dor and and his students and uh, Robert Bella and and others too uh, that brought in brought in new ways of of looking at Japan. Yeah, and I would add to that, uh, I would footnote this as saying that by by drawing in other business school or other social scientists, uh, cultural anthropologists, psychologists, industrial psychologists, uh, operations management 
people, the whole MIT bunch, right? Um, the I, I think that 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 Ezra actually did establish a new way of studying Japan, which is bringing in these discipline guys, because he, he actually also organized these study tours, right? I know that he went to Japan in the early 80s with a group of people from UC Berkeley, which became one of the big places to study Japan in the 80s and 90s, right? And uh, so it wasn't only an East Coast thing, it also kind of spilled over to the West Coast. And, um, and he just drew so many people into, into this and the more the merrier approach and his continuity and generosity also played into this in, in major ways, I would say. By the way, I, I'd also like to make a point that even I have a hard time reading Japan as number one I, without wincing uh, and uh, you know getting sort of scratchy all over. However, it gave him a level of celebrity in Japan that was amazing. And in his last trip to Japan, which was November 2019, uh, I have a poster I can show you, but he filled auditoriums in Nagoya, Osaka, Fukuoka, thousand seat auditoriums on the basis of posters up Ezra Vogel, author of Japan is number one. And it, it also gave him an impact in December, 2013 when Abe uh, went to Yasukuni Jinja and uh, Ezra came in 2014, shortly thereafter. And he had asked the embassy in Washington to set him up with a meeting with Abe. Abe unfortunately was out of town. So my secretary was usually in charge of making his appointment. So uh, he said, well, call the Conte. We called the Conte. And within that day, we had a meeting with Suga. And Suga spent two hours with us. And Ezra could register his complaint about Yasukuni and they could talk about Sino-Japanese relations. That was amazing. He had access to anybody he wanted to get access to in Japan. And he used it wisely. Uh, but it, but uh, it was pretty amazing. I think yeah, and that, also... is, that is because it, it created this, it created this, I mean, we could, I could be a little bit facetious at the risk of uh, overdrawing it, but but you know, did Ezra cause the bubble economy? Because if you look back at the bubble economy, right? It was all about Japan as number one. Can our stock market be bigger than the American US stock market? Can we be better than America, right? A, a, a lot of people accused Ezra of causing it. Uh, <laughs> we had dinner one night with uh, Otabuchi from Nomura before he passed away. And, and as he got drunker, he would say, you cause a bubble economy. <laughs> a lot of people thought that. Uh, that's a bit rich. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit rich. It's a bit rich, but they have to blame it on somebody. <laughs> if I may pick up on one point that both of you have just made, uh, which is one of the biggest, um, I should say, holes in the economics profession's approach to technology uh, is to presume that it is a, um, call it an exogenous variable. Okay, it's kind of outside. My view is that diffusion of technology is vastly under studied. How did technologies get from point A to point B? And one thing Ezra did was he was um, an immense diffuser of thoughts about Japan. And to get different people in different disciplines to come together and think, oh, what about Japan? Or what about China? What about Canton? Under to get them to think about different ideas from different places is immensely stimulative. So I think his role as a diffuser uh, of uh, called Japanese uh, approaches, or even of Chinese approaches. His work on on um, uh, uh, on Deng Xiaoping is an example, but his work as someone who gets knowledge to diffuse more quickly, whether you agree or disagree with what he says, but that diffusion element of what he did was immensely important. I, I see oh. that. Sorry. Well, I would just. Uh, just a, on that point, I see that somebody asked a question about Ezra's period in the uh, as the national as the officer for national intelligence for East Asia, mm -hmm. and one of his frustrations in that job was was his discovery that people in Washington don't read books. You're not going to get people to read 600 page books. Mm -hmm. It's hard enough to get them to read a one page summary. Mm -hmm. 
at how difficult it is to get ideas across to the, the people who are in charge of strategy. And so he went back to Harvard and he started teaching. You have to teach students how to write op-eds. They have to write op-eds. They have to, they have to get, be able to get their ideas into 700 words, which is too many for staffers in Washington, but nonetheless. Uh, and so he made a big deal about that after he came back from Washington. So we have um, we 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 have a lot of comments on Japan and Germany, which uh, I would like to take up at a different Zoominar because that that is actually a super interesting question. I'll get I'll I'll go back there, but I do want to get back to Ezra's work on China before we uh, close up because it, this conversation would be incomplete. And so uh, there there are, the his, his later books were all about China. And yet again, there is some criticism. Was he too soft on Tiananmen Square? And, and was, was his vision like that? What is your, uh, Rick, if you wanna, or both of you actually, if you wanted to um, sort of close the loop there and kind of give us the whole picture, how does this China work relate to the Japan work and what are the takeaways from I, that? I, I, I've thought a lot about it. I, Ezra and I, I worked with him intensely on the Facing History book. Uh, we spent about three years and I, I made many trips and we, we also made trips about around Japan and around China. And I argued with him a lot on the, uh, the conclusion, uh, you know, Japan's no longer number one. I, I said, you know, that's not the way to think about it. You have to think of a multi, multi-polar world. And, and the conversation we were in the middle of when he died was about the rivalry between the US and Japan in Southeast Asia. And I said, that's the wrong way to think about it, Ezra. The world is not a, bi it's, it's not a bilateral world where it's Japan. The Japanese investment in ASEAN is bigger than the United States or China. The number of employees in ASEAN working for Japanese companies many times bigger than working for Chinese companies or US companies. That it's not, it's, and, uh, we were having that literally, our last exchange was December 17th. And uh, trying to get him to look, look, China's bigger than the United States. We all, you know, it's 10 times bigger in terms of population or whatever. But we have to think in terms of like Ishibashi Tanzan. And I, I lobbied to get Ishibashi Tanzan into the Facing History book. Ishibashi Tanzan said, Japan is smaller, but Japan will have an impact. And this is something that also Hugh has brought up. The assets of any country outside of their, their home country, the overseas assets, Japan has more overseas assets than any country in the world. Japan is bigger than its GDP or GNP. And you know that when you travel from Jakarta West on Highway 1 and you're stuck in traffic jams and they're all Japanese cars and you're going past industrial parks that are all Japanese companies no Chinese companies, no American companies. So, and so you know, that was the conversation we were having. We, the, world, you, the world can't grasp, the United States, people in America, and even maybe people in China can't grasp a multipolar world. <laughs> Robbie, uh, what, some pouting, pouting thoughts from you on this topic. Well, thank you. I think Rick has just mentioned an extraordinarily Im important point, uh, which is that multipolar worlds are a lot more complicated to organize than hub and spoke systems. If you think of, you know, O'Hare Airport, for example, it's pretty simple, okay? But when okay. it goes out, there's a big problem. We now have a very multipolar world. The world is now moving away from China being the O'Hare Airport of the manufacturing system into a much more uh, dynamic and, and sort of multi-centered system just because of reasons of resilience. And I think Japan probably is ahead of other countries in understanding that uh, because of various uh, natural disasters 
uh, over the years. Earthquakes come along, you've got to redo your, um, your supply chain in a way that you can, can keep, keep supplying your suppliers even when there's a disaster somewhere. So Japan understands that very well. And I think because of that, Japan is well placed to understand uh, how, I call it more um, diverse or more distributed uh, networks should work. Inside Japan, there are a number of issues on that as well. For example, the transportation system, heavily centered on Tokyo and Haneda Airport. That I think has actually devalued property in the rest of the country. And therefore, uh, if we can have a more distributed global manufacturing sector, service sector, et cetera, I think that the periphery would gain a great deal and make everybody more prosperous. So that's another thing I think that this, uh, this conversation that Rick just had with Ezra uh, might have some extraordinarily important implications for the way the world economy works. Yes, and, um, and I would just add, maybe you should all read Japan is number one again today. Uh, certainly the US is looking for new answers and maybe we can find them in old books. Maybe we need to write some new books. Maybe we need to uh, go around and search a little farther. But I, I really uh, uh, would like to thank you and, and on this note that Japan is much larger than just Japan. And the, and the networks are larger, the impact is larger, the reach is larger. Maybe a small country is, by the way, not that small. Uh, <laughs> but it, but it, it, it's the 11th largest country in the world. But, but it's, yeah, it, it, um, it, it, it's, might be even playing above par. So, uh, so thank you very much, both of you, uh, Rick Dyke, Robbie Feldman. It was a great conversation. Uh, it, it had everything I was hoping for. And audience, thank you for joining us today. And please be back uh, next week. We'll learn uh, what's happening with Japanese marketing after Dentsu. And uh, there's a lot of new stuff going on. So uh, let's uh, meet again in seven days. And until then, please stay safe and take good care. And thank you both for joining me today.